So I want to talk a little bit about the mystique. Yeah. Because I'm old enough to have lived through some of the Zeppelin years. I was too young to see them live at in the day. I was hoping to see them on the tour where Bonham died, but I didn't get to see them then. But I certainly lived through the Zeppelin years in my youth enough to know that if you lived through that, if you didn't live through that, you can't really appreciate fully Jimmy Page's mystique at that time. Again, we talked about them being at, at, you know, at odds with the press. So they weren't around. And one way to create mystique is not be available. All right. The less available you are, the more people are curious, especially if you're successful and your albums are selling a zillion people. No one ever sees you. There's a mystique. This is like Kiss without the makeup, right? Right. Kiss created mystique and people always wondered what they look like without their makeup. And in their prime, Led Zeppelin were not available for interviews. They were not available, not much anyway, not available for press. And so they were creating this, this humongous impact in the rock world, both live and on recordings, but you couldn't get access to them. You didn't know who they were. You didn't know what they were. You didn't know what they were about other than through their music. And this was also by design by Jay, because he always wanted to just pay attention to the music. That's all that matters, right? So yeah, I remember back when I started the site and young players would sort of rag on Jimmy for being not that impressive or whatever, you know, his sloppy playing and, and all of that. And those people didn't experience Jimmy Page in his own time. Yeah. So you had to live through at least some of the Zeppelin years to fully appreciate Jimmy's mystique. And like I said, when I started the site, there were young players who didn't get why he is so revered because they'd, they'd grown up on Van Halen or people who are more technical or something like that. And they listen to Jimmy Page and they hear him being comparatively sloppy in places like that. And they don't understand that in the seventies, Jimmy had an absolutely magical aura about him. And if you were young and impressionable and not yet a guitar player, Jimmy was totally larger than life. And in a time before synthesizers, where synthesizers would create a bunch of different sounds that you'd never heard before, you could go to a Led Zeppelin concert or you could just go see Song Remains the Same and watch Jimmy Page make sounds with his guitar and a violin bow and an echoplex and theremin that you'd never heard before. And it was there was sounds like What's... sounds you did not expect in your mind that could come out of a guitar were coming out of this man's guitar. What's and a, they were not sounds you'd, you'd heard before. So, What's a theremin or an echoplex? So an echoplex is just an echo device that will g give you sort of a, a bunch of repeats on whatever you play. Okay. Uh, it was a tape echo back in the day before we had digital delays and stuff like that. You had tape echo, which was a little box with a little tape loop in it. And, you know, you put your guitar sound through that and you'd get echo because it would swirl back around and you'd get what you, you know, what you played the last time and all that. It's, it's a wonderful little device that still sounds great. They're, they're temperamental and all. But if you set this thing, you could make a lot of noise with it in some ways. You could beat the crap out of the Echoplex and make it sound all wishy and have all these weird effects come out of it. And it was just like you could use it as a, in a way that was never intended to be used and just make it do all of these weird sounds that were not, hadn't been heard, really. And then he had this theremin thing. A theremin is a weird device. It's, it's hard to describe what it is. It's something that creates a little electric field. The best way to look this up is to, is to look on YouTube and see what a theremin is. And we'll show you a clip of what it sounded like doing this and show you what he looked like doing this. And when you're 13, 14 years old, and you've never seen anything like this and never heard anything like this, he's coaxing all of these sounds out of like gear and you've never heard anything like it. And he, it, he's literally looking like Merlin, the magician up there, the way he's dressed in, in his stage attire, which he had like some of the coolest clothes that anyone ever wear, wore on stage, the dragon suit, which is the most famous. It was in, you know, the exhibit recently at uh, the Met uh, this, they had this great exhibit of like, all this guitar stuff at the Met and Jimmy Page donated a, a boatload of his gear and his stage clothes and stuff. And then of course 
in the book that he put out recently called the Jimmy Page Anthology, he shows you in like glorious coffee, co- coffee table book format in on glorious, you know, paper stock with like wonderful photography. He's showing you pictures of all of the stage gear he wore in the Zeppelin days and all and the Yardbirds days. Like, like I said, he kept everything. So he had like he had this this dragon suit, which is black velvet with this this embroidered dragon all the way up the suit. Then he had this other thing that was like stars and planets all over it with his with his uh, astrological signs on the legs and stuff. He looked mystique and you know ma- majesty and mystique. He just dripped of it because he you know no one else dressed like this on stage, and he had this this really magical aura about him and by the way that's just the onstage part of it he had that aura about him offstage too and the book that we read talks a little bit about this um he was very much into the occult which only added to his mystique uh he was into alistair crowley in a major way um yeah, a lot of musicians were yeah but i mean not all of them bought crowley's house yeah <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and, and opened El- up Elisha- and opened up a bookstore that was specifically to sort of like acquire and then you know resell Crowley manuscripts and stuff. But tell me a little bit about this Crowley character because he he seems to have a, quite a big influence on multiple musicians from that time for some reason. Yeah, I mean he was. Um, I guess I don't know what you'd call him necessarily a Satanist or anything, but he was. I mean, I guess these days you might call him like. Uh, an uber libertarian or something like that, where he's like, uh, "Do what thou wilt should be the war, you know the the rule of the law," or I think is is the quote, you know, "Do whatever you want," is basically the Crowley thing. And boy, did Jimmy Page really <laughs> grab a hold of that idea. Uh, and for better or worse, that was again Crowley was a guy who. I guess lived in the 1800s. You can look up Aleister Crowley and all of the stuff about him uh, easily as anyone can on Google. And um, he was a guy who was sort of a rock star of his own day in the writer sense. Uh, he was a guy who got into heroin and he got hooked on heroin and he had his demons as well. He's uh, a guy who's definitely associated with the occult. And like you said, he was appealing to a lot of people, even just, you know, just from a curiosity standpoint. But I think Jimmy Page certainly took it a little bit beyond just a, a, a curiosity. He he was deep into Crowley. Um, it was just a fascination for him by all accounts. Um, but it, what happened was when you at that time, when you were into something like that and you had this mystique about you anyway, and you have a band that's wildly successful beyond anything else that's going on right now, and people start thinking maybe they sold their soul to the devil for all of this success. And, you know, he has this dark uh, image about him and uh, where the people who, you know, it's not just that, okay, the fans out in the audience have never seen anything like this and he's this dark, mysterious character. People who knew Jimmy Page felt that he had this palpable dark energy around him. And people like David Bowie, who knew him, were totally freaked out by him. And people th- said he had this dark energy and he was they, there was this ominous quality to him. And some of that was cultivated by him. Clearly he cultivated it and I'm sure he didn't mind having this, you know, this image. But part of it was just this association with the occult, this association with creating this mystique. The book the, talks about how people like David Bowie would, were totally freaked out by Jimmy Page. He was you know? terrified of him. Yeah, absolutely terrified. And, you know, that team, you know, Bowie was on a shitload of drugs, too, and was, you know, super paranoid, too. And, you know, on the kind of drugs like cocaine that make you very paranoid. So, I mean, it, you know, it all feeds into each itself. But and it was interesting to read in this book and. Again, I will reference this book. It's called um, Jimmy Page, The Definitive Biography by Chris Salis. And you'll see it in other books, too, but this is the one we were talking about. It made him have this uh, larger-than-life mystique that if you 
weren't living through it in the 70s, it's hard to convey how powerful that may have been to, you know, a generation of my my age. There's also stories of uh, when he was doing the soundtrack for this movie, Lucifer Rising. Right, Kenneth Anger. Yeah. yeah. And that guy, he was also into the occult stuff, and then they, uh, he, he would, like, put a curse on or a hex on the... Uh, on Jimmy and, and you know he well uh, that was because Jimmy took the job and then he got too too involved in drugs to really finish the job to yeah. be honest I mean that's what I gleaned out of that story he he wanted to do the work and then he just you know was too in his own heroin addiction to actually finish the work and his priority was always going to be Zeppelin so he was able to still function in Led Zeppelin to an extent during the heroin years but I mean things like the anger project never happened and you know and Kenneth Anger got very angry and, you know, it, it, yeah, he, he, but there was also the whole thing, like two magicians should never meet or something. That was another thing that kept coming back in that, uh, biography because yeah, well, man, anger was, anger was just as bitch, much of a loony as anybody else at that time. I mean, he, he was, he was his own bizarre character as well. I think he finished that movie like 40 years after he started yeah, or something. Yeah, exactly. Right. And Have you and seen think, it? No, but I, I know Jimmy put out the soundtrack eventually. Yeah, he also did the soundtrack of Death Wish too. Right, he did. And that was very interesting, um, but we'll get into that in the discography. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but anyway... So Jimmy had this, this magical aura on stage... On all of the stuff that I was talking about, there's just showmanship and badassery and attitude and cockiness and all of that. But he was also playing his ass off at a time where, you know, whatever you want to say about his playing now compared to like the bar has been raised by the 80s school of guitar where people were cleaner and faster in his day. Jimmy was as fast as anybody. Jimmy was as flashy as anybody. He was better than most of the horrible uh, American hard rock players, uh, other than the guys like the guys in Aerosmith. Uh, but, you know, all of the corporate rock stuff that was out in, in those days. Uh, What's an example know, of like that? Uh, I don't want to say it, but like, just like in terms of like the faceless early seventies, American rock, like Bachman Turner overdrive and stuff like that, you know, those kinds of things compared to those guys, Jimmy Page was absolutely on another level guitar wise. Right. You know? And so he had this, this incredible impact. And so for a lot of us at a certain age, Jimmy Page was the guitar God. And he wasn't just that his guitar style influenced our guitar style, which it did, but he influenced our lives in a way that other players didn't. For example, I started out on bass guitar. I probably, and and if I look back on it, I think I switched to guitar because of Jimmy Page uh, and a little bit of Pete Townsend. But legions of us picked up a guitar for the first time because of Jimmy Page because just because what he was doing on stage just looked so damn cool and sounded so damn good you said I want to be I want to do that I want a part of that and we grew our lo- our hair long because of Jimmy Page we wanted less Pauls because of Jimmy Page and when we got them we wore them too low because of Jimmy Page you wear them around your you know around your your balls instead of playing them up where you need to be playing. <laughs> Jimmy Page wears this guitar so impossibly low in those days. It was just you you marvel at how he's able to even play as well as he did because if you ever try to play a Les Paul slung that low, there's parts of that neck that's really hard to reach. If you watch a guy like the only guy who still does that is Zach Wilde. And <laughs> if you watch Zach, he wears he wears the thing really low. And then what happens is when he has to play anything technical, he puts his foot up on the monitor and sticks the guitar on his knee because you can't play it technically well down that low. Right. right. Not not really super proficiently. And Zach Wilde is of course a fantastic example of also a super ballsy player. He's another son of Jimmy Page. Much of what Zach Wilde does is directly from Jimmy Page and, you know, his other influence as well. But we're talking about the mystique and we're talking about the influence. And like I said, a whole generation of us picked up a guitar because of Jimmy Page. And then you talk about 
the guys who are directly influenced by the Jimmy Page stuff, like Zach Wild, like Joe Perry, like Slash, right? Not that they don't have other influences too. Michael Shanker, right? A guy who doesn't sound a lot like Jimmy Page, but when you look at it, what he's playing, a lot of that stuff is Jimmy Page licks played at a much higher level of proficiency and doing very Jimmy Page like ideas. And the other side of this on the guitar side of this is like when you say, you know, Chuck Berry licks, people know what you mean by Chuck Berry licks most of the time, how 50s licks, 1950s licks on guitar, most of them come from Chuck Berry, right? Most of the licks of the 70s that became stock rock licks in the 70s come from Jimmy Page. If you listen to Led Zeppelin 1 and Led Zeppelin 2 particularly, there is a bunch of guitar licks on those albums that most rock players have in their arsenal. Okay? There, there are certain kinds of licks that are now stock hard rock licks. They feature techniques like hammer-ons and pull-offs, which is where you're not necessarily picking every note, but you're letting your fit, your left hand, your fretting hand fingers do some of this work for you to play fast, flashy licks. And those licks, whether they be, you hear them, like I said, in these guys like Shanker, you hear them in Zach Wilde, you hear it in Joe Perry, you hear it in the guys in Thin Lizzy, uh, Brian Robertson and, and Scott Gorham. All of these guys are playing these licks that came from Jimmy Page and, you know, that level of influence on lead work too. And on some tracks, you also hear double guitars, like double tracked guitars, two guitars playing the same. More than two, a lot of the time. Um, the other thing, we, you know, back when we talked about the production, he was very, in, what he liked to call, he created what he liked to call a guitar army, hmm. where you have loads and loads of guitar tracks to make, make up this massive sound. And a great example of that is something like Achilles' Last Stand, where you have tons of guitar tracks in that thing and in the light also you had towards the end of in the light you get like you know four or five different guitar tracks coming in and 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 making up this this wall of sound that and then like we in said general is just just very impressive yeah there's nothing small here yeah everything about zeppelin is big it can sometimes be intimate but it's never small no it's always big one of my friends who I hang out with sometimes I put on Zeppelin too when I'm hanging out there and and uh, he's told me like yeah I put on some albums lately and listened to pretty much all of it in a couple of days and uh, yeah that's some serious music it's no joke and that's a thing that really sums it up that it's serious yeah, stuff it's timeless yeah it's really timeless I mean you could say it sounds dated now or whatever you want it but I mean the, it, it, the songs still work yeah Everything there still works. I don't think every song ever done by Led Zeppelin is is like there. There are some clunkers, I think, but very few. But there are a few yeah. clunkers in the Zeppelin catalog and some outtakes and stuff like that. But for the most part, the catalog stands up to this day and, yeah. and still uh, is is as good as or better than most everything else. If you're into if you're into heavy rock, certainly. Yeah, I agree with that. So his influence is is monumental on, on on multiple levels. He also became one of the iconic images of a lead guitar player, right? What did, what should a lead guitar player look like after you know? So you could contend that almost all rock badass style goes back to Keith Richards because Keith Richards is a style icon in terms of what he wore and how he wore it and all of the things, you know, that he, he, he started and, you know, Keith was really that the icon of the badass guitar player, right? That starts with Keith, but the next guy is Jimmy and Jimmy becomes the badass lead player as opposed to just the badass guitar player. So this is where you get the image of the guy with the guitar slung way low and the long curly hair. Hello, Slash. Yeah. <laughs> and Slash wouldn't look like what Slash looks like if there hadn't been a Jimmy Page. Yeah, he's sort of, so, a, yeah, almost a, well, to call it's the, the template. copies would be an insult, but 
it's definitely you can definitely see where it's coming from. Yeah, and this is you know this is a part of influence. There's musical influence, there's production influence, there's style influence, and there's image influence. So all of this is coming off of Jimmy Page in Gobs. Yeah. All right. It's it's so multifaceted. There's a clip of Alec Baldwin, who's older than me, talking about Zeppelin in one of the, you know, one of VH1's things where they're talking about the greatest bands of all times. And, and he was like waxing more about it than even I do. He's like, Jimmy Page, are you kidding? You'd cut off your hand to meet Jimmy Page in those days. And so if you're a musician, if you are not a guitar player and you picked up a guitar because of Jimmy, if you are a guitar player and you're learning his licks, that's an influence. If you base your image on him, that's an influence. If you base your production of your own music on what he did, that's an influence. If you pull out a mandolin, that's an influence. All of this stuff, the scope of his impact is on, on hard rock is just immeasurable. And it goes beyond, for example, the impact of a Richie Blackmore and a Tony Iommi, whose impact was large enough, but not on this many levels. Yeah. And that's why Jimmy has the larger stature in some respects. Yeah, out of all the guitar gods, he's the biggest one. Yeah, who did more? No one. I mean, you can say Eddie Van Halen did... He he did for guitar another kick up the ass to another level, sure. certainly. But the scope of what he did was more contained than the scope of what Jimmy did. Yeah, and he was in, he was just as influential on a, on a next generation of guitar players. But you're not getting you're not getting, you know, going to California. You're not getting Cashmere. You're not getting Zeppelin three out of out of. Eddie, you're getting a much more concise package, a much more pop-oriented package. And there's nothing wrong with that. I'm just saying, scope-wise, who cuts a wider swath than Jimmy Page? Other than maybe, you know, some people like Bowie, who is very experimental, or the Beatles. But it's not, but the Beatles isn't really in the hard rock uh genre. And the other thing that's interesting about Zeppelin also, and you can say, you cannot say this about, you can almost every band of that era was hugely influenced by the Beatles in one way or another, including Black Sabbath. We've talked about how, how important the Beatles were to everyone in Black Sabbath, especially Ozzy. Yeah. Hugely influential. You don't hear any Beatles influence in Zeppelin. I don't. No. There's no Beatles influence in Zeppelin. They they they're mainly blues influences there. Yeah, but I mean the Stones. The Stones have a Beatles influence. The Stones chased the Beatles for a while, especially in the '60s. They were trying to do and keep up with the Beatles and all everything. They got out of it. They became their own thing. Once the Beatles folded, the Stones took their own direction. But think of, I mean, The Who had some Beatles influence in it. Not a lot, but in the early pop days, there's no Beatles influence in Zeppelin that I could hear. And that's unusual. And I'm not saying it's a bad thing or a good thing. I'm just saying it's unusual to have an era, a band come out of that era that, does, and it, that doesn't have a Beatles influence. Yes has a huge Beatles influence. It's Deep, Deep Purple, you put Beatles covers on their first album. Yeah, they only turned into a hard rock band after their, what was it, fourth album? or The fourth album, yeah. yeah. But, but on the first album, they did a cover of Help, and I think they did another Beatles, I think they did two Beatles covers or something. Like that. And they did them psychedelically and stuff. But I mean, it's interesting that of all of those people, Pink Floyd has a huge Beatles influence in just the sonics of the studio and, and doing the same stuff at Abbey Road that the Beatles did, right? In the production side, their, their influence was huge from the Beatles. Zeppelin doesn't have a Beatles influence that I can hear. They're their own animal. And that's all coming out of Jimmy Page. So he was one of those rare super geniuses who just managed yeah. to get the right people together and the stars and planets aligned and... Something yeah. magical happened there. Absolutely. Absolutely. 